Hi there, welcome back to Book and the Spade. I'm here with Brother Roger from Sacred Heart, and today we are going to be discussing a local legend, um, a man of many miracles whose name is Father Salinas Casey. So, Brother Roger, yes. Uh, uh, when did Father Salinas come here? Uh, Father Salinas came here after he was ordained a priest, and his first assignment as the priest was to come to Sacred Heart from 1904, and he left the parish of Sacred Heart in 1918 when he was transferred to New York City. And he was a rather unusual priest, right, in so much as he was a simplex priest. Right. A simplex priest was that, at that time in our church history, a simplex priest was someone that was ordained a priest, but he wasn't permitted to hear confessions or preach a formal doctrinal sermon on the faith. And exactly when did the miracles start? Well, it's hard to say because even as a young man when he was a prison guard, uh, he befriended a uh, member of the Jesse James gang. Really? Who was named Cole, uh, Cole Younger. And he was a very notorious uh, gangster. And even as a young man before Salinas became a Capuchin, he befriended this prisoner. And they had long conversations. And when he did leave the prison system, when Father Salinas was moving on, uh, Cole Younger gave his one of his few personal belongings, a, tr a wooden trunk. And when he entered the Friars, he took that wooden trunk to Detroit to become Capuchin. But the miracles happened at all different levels. It wasn't just physical cures that were happening when people came to speak to Father Solanus, but there were times where people were being reconciled in their families. If they were dealing with addictions or different personal problems, Solanus was a, a person that people went to felt his compassion, his understanding, and felt very much at ease to open up about the situations they were in. And Father Solanus helped them through those very difficult dark days. Now, what was interesting is earlier when we were discussing how the miracles happened, he wasn't um, necessarily considered a great mystic. No, no. Father Solanus was a very simple man. He was a farm boy from Wisconsin. And when people came to him, he put them very much at ease. And as I said, he didn't have all these wonderful advanced degrees, but he had a way of connecting people with problems and their faith back to God. He was like a, a mediator between the two. And a lot of times people were struggling with their faith, they were struggling with their personal situations, and he brought them back to God and to a better understanding of God. Now, let's talk about his life before his ordination, because what I found interesting is he was very much an ordinary guy. You know, he proposed as a young man to a girl who he loved. Right. He had, um, you know, a great fondness for playing the violin. Uh, he had a, a scratchy uh, voice from what I hear because of diphtheria. Yes, black diphtheria had hit that part of Wisconsin and his two sisters died from that, but Solanus was feared. And because of that illness, his voice was very uh, strained and very high pitched. And with Solanus was an everyday person. He loved baseball. He loved to go hunt. Uh, they had a baseball team, which out of the 10 brothers in the family, they had the KC9, uh. which was a baseball team. He was an outfielder. And so he was an ordinary person who eventually came to find God in a deeper way and wanted to make a difference in the world. Now, did he have a great devotion to any particular saints? He had particular saints that he was very uh, fond of. In the Solanus Center in Detroit, there is a chapel, well, an outdoor area where there are different saints that were influencing him on his spirituality. Uh, Catherine Drexel, who worked with the Indians and the African Americans. Uh, St. Anthony of Padua. Uh, St. Martin de Porres. So there were particular saints that he was very fond of reading their, their uh, writings and their life, and he was imitating some of their spirituality. Now, in what ways do you think he exemplified the Capuchin mission? Because he does strike me as very much a, a student of St. Francis in, a, in his approach and in his uh, uh, return to uh, simplicity. Right, Father Solanus was extremely simple in his way of life, as all the friars were at that time. It was a very austere life at that time. And when he thought of becoming a Capuchin and he had done a novena to the Blessed Mother and it ended on December 8th. 
And during after communion, he heard within himself a voice saying, go to Detroit, which meant join the Capuchins. That really unsettled him a little bit because he knew the Capuchins were very austere and very simple. And so, but he figured this is what God wants of me. I'll leave my life in God's hands. So he went to Detroit and I think once he put the habit on, he felt very much at home. And the way he lived his simple life, uh, he didn't need a lot of extraordinary things as a lot of people do today. He was very simple and very direct in whatever he did. Now, in meeting with some very important people, for example, you said, I think, the, the governor of New York? Right, the governor of Detroit came to see him, the mayor. Uh, bishops would come to see him. Very um, people of high rank would come to see him. And they were seeking out his advice because he was very well known of giving very solid, basic advice to them. Like, he wouldn't give you a very long rendition of what you should do. Uh, Solanus was the type that would just say, look into yourself and get reconnected with God and live your life of loving God. And if you love God, you should also love your neighbor and everything else will fall into place. So in many ways, he ties directly into the mission of uh, Pope Francis right now. Correct. And, and I guess it is fortuitous, you know, I guess uh, heaven has its own calendar and divine plans. Mm -hmm. Now. In terms of your own relationship with Father Salinas, as you walk here, and you know that Father Salinas was on the same ground, um, do you feel his presence? I feel his presence because, um, not so much within the building. I know I walked through the halls of the friary where he walked, and the staircases that he took when he went up and down the stairs. But it's more so his presence that even years after he's gone, he's been going from this parish since 1918, his memory and his love of the people are still very much alive in the people today. They are always talking about Father Solanus, what they did to, with his grandparents or a relationship that they had. So his spirit is still very much here at Sacred Heart. So we know that Father Solanus met with many different people. Is there any uh, examples of him meeting with non-Catholics in ecumenical dialogue? Yes, uh, basically, he met with anyone who would talk to him. His philosophy and his approach to life was he would talk to anyone about God. So whether an atheist came to talk to him, an Episcopalian, a Lutheran, he was more than happy to talk to them about their faith and their struggles. And he didn't come across as saying, well, I only deal with Catholics or Catholics who go to Mass every Sunday. He was the type of person that basically talked to anyone about God. And there's one uh, story that Father Benedict Joseph Groeschel speaks of where there was a person who um, was on the phone and he was paraplegic and he couldn't come. So Father Solanus would speak to him on the phone and discuss you know, faith and his journey. And then he would get his violin and he would play on the phone. He would play some of his violin music to this uh, man who was unable to come and see him. And there was a special relationship. So it didn't matter whether what religion, what ethnic background you came from, Salinas would speak to anyone at any time, you know, regarding their faith and helping them. Now, was there a particular uh, technique of, of dialogue used? You said when um, someone was experiencing a potential healing, he would almost look away. Well, no, he, uh, he would, before a healing would take place sometimes, people noticed that he would just turn his head away, almost as if, you know, he was in dialogue with God. And then he would just turn back to the person and then tell the person what would be happening to them or someone that they loved. Now, is there any miracles associated directly with uh, people who've been around the parish um, or on the parish grounds? Like, do we have records of someone back from, like, let's say, 1918? Yes. Uh, the Spring family, who lived here on Shonard Place, was a friend, Mr. Spring, oh, they call him Old Mr. No, Spring, and it was a lodge family here in Yonkers, and he was here. And someone was, had been dying at the family home here on Shonard. And they came over and they said, uh, Father Slans, would you come over? Our family is in dire need of your prayers. The doctors have given up hope on this person. And Father Slanus said, well, I can't leave the friary right now because I'm on duty. So he took out his personal rosary beads and he gave them to Mr. Spring. And he said, place these on the person 
and pray and have faith and confidence in God. And by tomorrow afternoon, the fever will leave him and the person will recover. Another time there was a woman who was very ill, um, an Italian woman, and they would come up and they would just say, there was a little girl and she could speak both languages and they would say, well, go to the top of the hill, go to the monastery and get the holy priest. The holy priest was basically Father Solanus. And Father Solanus would leave with this little girl and go down to Pasavianca where the Italians had been, were living at the time and he would help and she would translate for him and you know, miracles would happen. Even today, miracles are happening here. There's a case of a woman who was in need of a transplant or a kidney transplant. She was about probably about 48 years old and her mother gave me a note and said, when you're going to Detroit, I don't want you to read my note, just place it on Father Solanus's tomb and say a prayer. She didn't tell me what it was for. And I came back and they said, it's going to take a long time for you to get a transplant because this is your second transplant. And basically when I came back, she never told me, but within maybe two weeks, they got a call from the hospital saying they have a perfect match for a kidney transplant. And she went down, she had the transplant, and she's been fine ever since. So miracles are happening even today here in, at Sacred Heart. And people do come and hope that Father Solanus will help them in whatever need they have. Whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, people are constantly turning to Solanus that he might intercede to God to help them. Now, we know that uh, many relics do remain, at least uh, you know, I hear that there is a personal rosary up in Detroit, which he handled. And we have right here the baptismal font. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about the font. Well, basically, this, the chapel to Father Solanus is the original baptismal font of Sacred Heart Church. And the baptismal font that we see here in the chapel is basically the font that he baptized over 300 children during his 14 years here at Sacred Heart. And would that classify as a second class or third class? That would be a second class because a first class relic is something of the person themselves. A second class rec relic is something that's been touched to them directly like their habit or their robes or in this case the baptismal font. And then a third class relic is something that's been touched to where the person is buried. Now, in terms of Father Solinus' uh, dedication to the rosary, um, it seems interesting that he would give that rosary to someone who is ill. Uh, did he have a particular devotion to that he, sacramental? He does have a great devotion to the Blessed Mother and to the rosary. And when he was discerning whether or not he should become a priest, uh, there was an incident that happened. He was a streetcar conductor, and he was 17, and he was there, and at one point that day, there was a mob of people on his track, so he had to stop the streetcar. And what had happened was there was a drunken sailor who had stabbed a woman to death. And it was at that point that Solanus went to the chapel as a young man and was praying all night. And what was interesting is he didn't just pray for the woman. He was also praying for the man who was so drunk that he didn't realize that he was taking her life and was stabbing her. So he prayed for both of them during the night. And for the Blessed Mother, he did that novena when he was discerning about religious life and going to the Capuchins. So he always had a constant uh, love for the Blessed Mother. And what seems interesting to me is the fact that he seems to have had a direct vision or experience of her. What was that experience like? The experience was he had asked his mother and his sister to join him in a novena of discerning his vocation, whether or not he should enter religious life after being rejected from the prep seminary from the diocese. And so he did a novena which ended on the Feast of Our Lady on December 8th. And it was at after communion when he was kneeling in the church and there's different versions of what had happened. But he heard an inner voice say, go to Detroit. With that message from the Blessed Mother, he knew that he was called to become a Capuchin. So even though he didn't, he wanted to become a Capuchin and it was at the beginning of December, and the family said, please don't leave right away because this might be your last Christmas with us, because back then we didn't visit our families too often of the distance and so forth. And he said, no, I'm going to Detroit. God wants me in Detroit. So he packed his bags. He took that trunk from Cole Younger that he had received, 
and he arrived at St. Bonaventure's in Detroit on Christmas Eve. Now, what's interesting to me is, despite the fact that he was bent on this vocation, he knew it was what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he wasn't an intellectual. He, he didn't fit the mold for the time. No. No, basically, by becoming a simplex priest, which he was basically doing sacristy work, working with the altar boys, he basically, they didn't think he had enough to work here at Sacred Heart, so they assigned him two years after he arrived here in Yonkers to help the brother, who was the work of the brothers, to answer the door as being the porter. And that opened up a whole new world to him because he got to meet a lot of people he normally would not have been exposed to. And he would be sweeping the sidewalk and he would talk to anyone and everyone going by. And this is where be- people began to see him as a person of compassion, a person of understanding. And people started to flock here to Sacred Heart to see and to speak with him and to seek his advice and his prayers. Now, out of curiosity, um, I often think that the beginning of saints' lives are, are incredibly important, but so are the end. Um, in terms of the death of Father Silas, are there any stories or moments of great epiphany which are worthy of note? Well, when Father Solanus uh, had a skin ailment, and it was very painful. I mean, one of the friars, Brother Ignatius from Detroit, went to see him in the hospital in his final days, and they said his body was as red as a lobster. His skin was flaking. It was very painful, and they said, is there anything we can do for you? And he said, no, no. He says, I accept all that God sends me. And what was interesting was I met a couple of people in Detroit some years back, and they were in the hospital and they realized Father Solanus was in the hospital and he was near the end of his life. They were sneaking up in the middle of the night and hoped to see and speak with Father Solanus. And there was a couple of people that were healed. And even after he had died, people went into his room to pray for his intercession and healings also took place at that time. So literally on his deathbed, healings were attributed. Healings were attributed. That, uh, but he was in great pain, but he said, no, I, I wish to suffer, you know, for the needs of the people, the poor and the sick. So we know that Father Salinas was alive during some very tumultuous points in, in Western history, namely the Great Depression. Correct. And, of course, the Second World War. Um, how did that impact him? Did he ever discuss openly the suffering of his prisoners, because it doesn't seem like he'd make a polemical statement about these events. No, I mean, he basically, he knew the depression was coming, people were out of work in Detroit, and this is what instigated him and a couple of the other friars to found the food pantry. And in the food pantry, we had hundreds of people coming to the friary every day for food. And so he would go out and solicit food and call people and ask people to give so that they can feed the hungry. And even in, there's a story that's told that a young, a young couple had come and their son was in the military in World War II. And they, he was out on a ship in, out in the Pacific. And they said, we're concerned about our son and the safety of our son. And it was tradition for Father Solanus to ask people to give, enroll them in the Mission Association, the Cavishan Mission Association. And he said, let's not just enroll your son, let's enroll the whole ship, all the members of the ship. The family thought it was a little strange. The couple said, all right, if this is what you want, we'll enroll the whole ship, which they did. And little did they know that later on they found out that the ship was torpedoed and the ship sank, but there was no loss of life. And so they attributed this that Father Solanus may have known something that the ship was going to be sunk by enrolling everyone on the ship it gave safety to all the members on the ship. And the depression was, it was also not just physically hard for them to find food and to find work and shelter, but it was very difficult because everyone was struggling to with the rations of the uh, depression. So he was able to help people in any way that he could, finding work, finding food, finding shelter. Uh, he really went out of his way to help people who were either sick or poor. And are there any other stories associated with, uh, with veterans? Because I know with Padre Pio, we hear, you know, of course, many people claiming to have seen uh, Pio in the sky in the middle of uh, dog battles, mm-hmm. you know, with the, with the air fires. Right. I don't know too many about, you know, individual situations like that. 
basically uh, during the war years, uh, people came to Solanus seeking his help and advice because they were very worried about their sons and daughters in the military. And they were in foreign countries and the reports were coming back and they was, the communication was not like it was today where you would have instant communication. So they had to wait sometimes weeks to get a letter from someone. So Solanus was a way of telling them to trust in God and have faith and to pray for their son or daughter in the war. And that whatever would happen, that God loved their son and loved their, and you know, wanted to watch over them. Now another aspect of Father Solanus, um, which I really do appreciate, is the fact that he said to thank God in advance. To Correct. And could you explain that for a bit? Well, when people came to seek Father Solanus's help, one of his favorite sayings was, thank God, ahead of time. There's a book in that title. And it was that when you go to God and ask for his help and in intercession to help you in whatever situation, you have to be like a little child going to your parents and going with such confidence and faith that you're going to get what you're asking for. So if a little girl wants a tricycle for Christmas, the way she approaches her parents is that it's a done deal. I know you're going to give me a tricycle or a bicycle for my birthday. And it's such confidence that she goes to her parents that Solana said, we have to do the same with God. We have to have such faith and confidence that God will hear us and grant what we're requesting to go with faith. So by extension, did he feel that worry and anxiety could actually impede God's plan? Um, or did he feel like we could use our sufferings and, and bear them like a cross? Well, he said that, you know, one of his second sayings that he was very popular in saying is, blessed be God in all his designs. And that was basically telling people that you can pray to God and ask for whatever you may need for yourself or your family or your working situation. But in the end, God loves you. And because God loves you, he will answer the prayer. It may not be the answer that you would like or in the way that you would like it or when you would want it but you would approach God that God loves you and God will watch over you and that whatever God, you know, God will bless you. Now, it's, what's interesting to me is we also read in the shrine that he wasn't a great writer, yet he wrote poems. He wrote yes. verse. He loved to write. Um, because his education was lacking, it did mean he was very creative in writing some poetry and writing very well uh, in a very simple way. He, he could cut through a lot of the, a lot of the deep theological language and so forth. And that's what people loved about him, that his, his dialogue was very simple. He was a farm boy. And so he could break through to a person, and explain God's love for them and their relationship to God and what it should be. But he could do it in very simple terms. He didn't give these long talks to people when they came to see him. He was very direct very simple, and being that he came, he was a very simple person, he could tell them in very simple languages that they could understand that they were loved by God and that God was there for them. So it was the poetry of experience rather than of theology. Correct. But he was very good in writing. He wrote to his brothers and sisters. A lot of the letters have been preserved. Uh, his niece, who was a religious sister, put a book together of his writings, of his letters, back and forth to the family over the years. Now, in terms of his relationship with, um, with the hierarchy of the church, was there any point where the hierarchy realized, oh, wait, we have a living saint or prophet on our hands. We need to look into this deeper. No, I mean, when Solanus, like I said, Solanus was not the only one ordained a simplex priest the year that he was ordained in 1904. And basically, when he was ordained, he had to sign a letter stating that he would never ask for full priesthood, meaning to hear confessions and to preach a formal sermon. Wait, so he, he signed a letter saying he would never ask? He would never ask. They say, well, we're going to ordain you to, as a simplex priest, but you can never really request that you could be ordained to full priesthood. Now, two of his classmates who were ordained simplex priests did request full ordination and they received it. But Solanus always regarded whatever God wants of me and he accepted it. He never did ask. He signed the paper. He was very grateful that he was ordained a priest 
And it was, he was one of three priests in the family. His two brothers were also priests, not Capuchins, but diocesan. But he just accepted God's will in his life, and he, he took it from there. Now, you said at one point, though, he was commanded by his superior to document. Right. So, well, you get to a point among the friars where we take a vow of obedience. And so if your superior says, this is what we are asking you to do, to be transferred, to take on a new ministry, and they'll say, in obedience, you must record these happenings. I'm sure Father Solanus did not want to record these happenings because it would bring attention to him and to his ministry as a friar. But the, the things that were developing, the provincial said, in obedience, I wish you to record these situations in a book so that we have records for the future. Now we know that um, other mystics, uh, such as Padre Pio, had experiences with the diabolic and with the angelic. Right. Um, is there any records of Father Solanus talking about his guardian angel or, or anything of that spectrum? Not too much. I mean, Father Solanus uh, dealt with, uh, when he first became a Capuchin, it, in his writings you can see that there were questions saying, am I doing the right thing? Why am I here? He was questioning, but he knew that this was what God wanted of him. And so the first day or two, he was very apprehensive of being with the Capuchins, but he said once he put on the habit and he felt very much at home. And as far as, um, I wouldn't say that he shied away from um, the publicity. Well, I, I, I would say that he did shy away from the publicity. Um, at the end of his life, we had to hide him in a sense huh. because so many people were coming by buses loads to speak with him. His health was failing, and so he would basically, we would try to contain the number of people he would see every day. Uh, he was in physical pain from the skin ailment, and there was one incident where a friar went around the backyard and Father Salinas thought no one was there. So he had lifted up his habit and he took the hose and he was washing his legs down just to give some relief to the pain on his skin. But once he realized that there was someone in eyesight, he basically you know, put, closed the hose and put down his habit and went his way. So he was a very private person in many ways. Now, in terms of the skin ailment, uh, when did that begin? Was it since his childhood? No, no, it wasn't since childhood, but it developed you know, later in his life. But he did have it for many years. And the miracle that Pope Francis accepted for him to be beatified was a woman who came from South America and she had a skin ailment similar to his and this happened a few years ago and she went to Detroit and she went there to pray for other people and while she was there she alerted the prize saying something is happening I don't know what but something is happening and she's had this doc this recorded ailment for many years and it was an instant cure that you know the, her skin uh, became you know very uh, smooth, uh, the scaling left her, and she was instantly cured. And that's the miracle that Pope Francis and the Church accepted to have Father Solanus move towards uh, canonization. Yeah, I mean, last, lastly, I, oh, yeah. um, sister, yep. Final questions here. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. One last question. Sure. Ultimately, so the the miracle that did take place. Um, that allowed for he becoming beatified. I heard the woman asked for everyone else to be healed and then had a tugging at her heart mm -hmm. um, for her, you know, a request for herself. In your right. own experience, I, I seem to see this pattern throughout the life of Father Salinas where it, it always comes down to service and putting oneself last for the service right. of the kingdom of God. Do you feel that sums up his life ministry? Yes, I think it does because even in his later years when he was older and sicker and everything, and one day he was sick as anything with a very bad cold and a young couple came in and Brother Leo, who was his secretary, said, Father, why don't you slip out now? You need to rest and take care of yourself. So why don't you slip out and I'll talk to the couple. And Father Solanus saw the look on their face and he said, no, no, no. He says, I'll stay and I'll speak to him. So Father, Brother Leo went to supper and two hours later, he came back and Father Solanus was still in dialogue with this young couple, uh, talking over their situation. So he always put other people's needs before his own. And so the friars had to be 
um, would you say, giving him a little bit of a hard time to say, Father, enough is enough, you have to take care of yourself. But he, he would go, he'd be playing billiards in the recreation room or he'd be at some place and the bell would ring for him that someone wanted to see him. And without any complaining, he would just get up and go off to meet the people that needed to speak with him. So he always put other people before himself. Well, thank you as always, brother. And I look forward to releasing this information to spread the good news of Father's okay. Thank you very much, so John. Much. All right, take care.